Hello. Oh, yes, there we go. Fab. So, great timing. Thank you very much. It's 1.30, so we'll start the afternoon session. Uh, you've already met myself, so I don't need to introduce. Uh, but today, now we have the clust first cluster topical session. This session is split into three different parts or topics, if you like. Uh, one being the electrolyte, which we'll start with, the composite cath composite electrodes, sorry, which take into account both the anode and the cathode. And then we have uh, and then we have solid state battery manufacturing as the last topic of this topical session. There will be a few breaks in between. We will go in the style of two talks and a Q and A, short break, and then continue. Uh, and then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce now our first speaker, Arthur Tron from the uh, from AIT, based in Austria, um, and you're representing the Sublime project. And um, thank you very much. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, hi, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Artur Tron. I'm a scientist on the solid state team in IT. Um, today I would like to present results from, uh, from Sublime, uh, especially for sulfate electrolytes uh, for dry and wet chemistry process for, uh, for sulfate-based electrolytes. Today I would like to discuss about for, especially for our generation of solid electrolytes and which results we can receive and how we can integrate into power cell. So, um, currently, uh, our coordinator, Fivi uh, Arash, today before lunch, and presented introduction about Sublime project. Um, we have uh, 15 partners and related with sulfate based because we have different chemistries for uh, sulfate based solid electrolytes and try to integrate in uh, our, uh, especially, a power cell. It's like our final. Uh, target. So currently you can see as results we can combine it uh, at first we can work with optimization components. So our partner to work on different uh, solid electrolytes especially in proof ion conductivity, particle size and so on. Afterwards all this stuff we can integrate for dry process and next step for wet chemistry process especially uh, a little bit to explain about this in the next one slides and uh, try to work in other pr uh, partners to uh, find some optimization, especially for interface and interf uh, and modeling all these parameters. Afterwards, uh, we can uh, transfer to production of monolayer. Actually, recently we can disseminate these results for uh, our, our partners, IST and TOB, and uh, present at first uh, monolayer and uh, sulfate-based um, solid-state battery cell. So currently, uh, you can see in the three chemistry, I don't want to focus a lot, just to mention for sulfate based, actually it's quite promising and interactive, of course, it's uh, quite challenging, especially to improve in some parameters, especially for ion conductivity and uh, high, uh, high potential compatibility and uh, another point for uh, lithium metal compatibility, because this parameter is quite open question, especially for sulfate based. Um, so regarding for uh, which actually points we can try to solve in our project and the, especially the interface, cathode materials, for example, lithium metal and mechanical electrochemical uh, issue. Because f compared to, for example, for oxide of polymer, in our case, we can apply for pr uh, pressure, especially for 10 MPa for cycling, it's a little bit high compared to polymer and oxides. Um, so you can look, for example, for production of solid state battery and the sublime, you can find that two ways. First, in uh, dry uh, chemistry process, actually we can densify all uh, uh, all components and dry without any polymers, uh, binders, and so on. Another one, and the wet chemistry process, you can see it's like more or less and similar with conventional uh, production electrode for lithium ion battery. However, it's another uh, binders and so on, uh, because it's also, it's, uh, I will discuss a little bit in the next slides. So you can see here, especially uh, regarding to binder and solvents, uh, the, it's quite open question, especially find best binder and solvent for uh, sulfate based because it's not possible to use, uh, the, for example, PVDF and NP. That's why in our case we can work and try to find uh, which binder and, and solvents in the best. For example, if you can, uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> For example, we can work especially for balancing for performance and processability. So actually we can uh, publish some results in, our, uh, in this year and uh, one publication, especially film processing, everyone can look 
if you're interesting. So currently, uh, you can see uh, regarding to balance between mechanical and electrochemical process because it's quite open question, uh, especially for production thin film for solid state battery with sulfate based solid electrolytes. That's why in our case we can try to find uh, which mechanical properties, for example, electrochemical properties. Electrochemical, it means ion conductivity of the film, because if you can incorporate some binder, for example, you can reduce a little bit to ion conductivity compared to pristine, for example. However, you need to find some best option between also binder and solvent to improve mechanical. That's actually all uh, next slides I will a little bit discuss and mention about that. So you can see uh, here, we can work in different parameters, especially for, uh, for example, uh, morphology of uh, film and particle size, uh, conductive additive, and uh, ratio between active material and solid electrolytes. Our coordinator today is presented before lunch. If you can increase uh, ratio 78% of active material for sulfate based, it's just theoretical because usually in literature it's maximum 70% and that's it. And uh, that's actually in our case, we can try to find which really ration is the best and find, for example, you can see optimization and optimization parameter. Uh, I mean, for specific capacity. So in, in our case, we can try to work with uh, all these parameters, especially for binder solar interaction and processability to receive quite nice uh, stand film, solid electrolytes and B layer. So you can see here, it's our uh, solid state electrolyte generation. First year we can work with uh, generation one, afterward generation uh, two, for example, generation three and generation three version two, and this year generation four. Um, so uh, you can see if during four uh, years we can increase ion conductivity for, uh, for five millisiemens. So currently it's quite promising, uh, but before usually we can work with generation uh, three version two, we can try to uh, produce a lot of uh, results and uh, try also these results we can implement to uh, production for mono layer. And um, this is just for dry process, especially uh, first our step, we can work with different optimization parameter and find best ration between solid electrolytes and the active materials. Also, we can look, for example, how to influence an air conductive agent. Afterwards, all these results, you can see it quite high performance, 150 approximately for NCM. And afterwards, all these results we can uh, transfer to for production for wet chemistry process. This actually is the main point for uh, production for stand film for solid electrolyte with sulfate based, especially uh, because not possible to use like conventional uh, solvent and binder like similar for lithium ion battery. Just uh, find non-polar actually. So you can see for we can work with three different groups uh, in BR, HMBR, PBMA, P, uh, CBS and CEBS. So and also different solvents to find which really is best and uh, especially for processability uh, which solvent is the best compared to for example in the binder. You can see for example we can receive quite nice thin film especially for our case. Um, and uh, afterwards, in, the, in other points, it's a quite open question, especially is the balance between mechanical properties and electrochemical. Because for example, you can see, this is quite nice mechanical properties, however, ion conductivity a little bit lower. But for this one, mechanical quite poor, but ion conductivity is high. So uh, we can try to find really its balance between mechanical and electrochemical properties and try to implement two, especially for production for stand film or b -layer, for example, with cassette materials, I mean. Um, next, actually, uh, regarding to processability by wet chemistry process. So you can see, uh, for example, if you uh, also we, our partners in our case, we can work with uh, reducing particle size to if you can quite poor, for example, you can receive quite poor for uh, cost. And also issue, especially for interface between uh, solid electrolytes and lithium metal, for example, or indium. And that's why we can also uh, try to increase uh, improve uh, our processability and stand film, for example, you can see here. And afterwards, this actually received quite nice electrochemical performance. So uh, this actually um, uh, solid electrolytes uh, B layer, and you can see it's like for producing five wet chemistry process. And this parameter we can uh, work with, especially for production for B layer and uh, uh, also, you can see for uh, performance 
especially for different, for example, thickness of stand fill, 100 or 300, so we, can fi we cannot find huge difference, just question is uh, on conductivity. And if, if you can apply for press device, for example, 10 megapascal, but if you can uh, transfer it all the cell, for example, in the coin cell, we can re uh, receive approximately uh, 90 milliampere per gram. Of course, it's issue, interface issue, and also uh, issue related with uh, pressing, because in the coin cell, uh, uh, pressing approximately 0 0.2 megapascal. If you press device, you, you apply during cycling, for example, 10 megapascal. So currently we can show some uh, uh, attractive methods and how to this data possible to implement, especially for production for power cell, because for power cell you need to uh, actually apply quite low pressure. Um, and uh, here you can see for sublime cathode electrolyte chain and all these results from uh, our part and uh, from our partners, we can implement to uh, another partners who are responsible for production for Monolar. Actually, these results you can find on our website or LinkedIn, for example. We also disseminate these results recently. Um, and the last one I would like a little bit to discuss about for energy density, actually, uh, our coordinator uh, today before lunch a little bit to mention. So if you can look, for example, just simple, if you same thickness of solid electrolytes or cathode materials, for example, you can see here, but if you uh, loading level, for example, 10 milliampere per centimeters, yes, it's possible to receive energy density 300. However, if you can reduce three times of solid electrolyte film, especially for wet chemistry process, for example, and cassette materials, however, loading level just 7 milliampere, but yes, it's possible to receive 500, 550 uh, watt hour per kilogram, but you need to also increase uh, ratio between active material and solid electrolytes usually and the literature mentioned just 70 percent approximately of cassette materials so this is actually main also point for sulfate based especially so if you can increase uh, more than 80 percent it doesn't work your cell so just uh, that's why it's quite nice especially if you consider regarding for production for power cell uh, it's possible to receive high energy density for example um so uh, regarding for conclusions, uh, we can, you can, our results, you can look at our publications and also all our results also disseminate on for our website and LinkedIn. And um, yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Arta, that's fantastic. So remember, we'll have one more talk and then we'll have a Q&A, so please keep your questions with you and then uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask those questions. Okay, so up next, let me dig out. Here we are, and I hope this works. Lovely, sorry, always the logistics of... Okay, oh, you are right? I had, yeah. Did it not come up? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, maybe it's a bit slow. Okay, all right. So up next, we have Timo Brandel from Daikin. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking still on the topic of electrolytes and representing the Astrobat project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I will present some of the results we were able to achieve in uh, collaboration with Fraunhofer Institute on uh, composite electrolytes of fluoropolymers and LSO particles. Um, but first, uh, I'd like to give a short introduction to the Daikin Chemical Review Group in general. Um, also, during the course of the Astrobat project, there was actually quite some changes within our organization and we also had to undergo a journey. So uh, I think this is an interesting part. Um, then I will talk a little bit about the results and then in the end I also would like to give a very short impression about how we use the results that we have now uh, generated in Astrobat in future developments and what we plan to do as well. So um, the presentation is a little bit long, I have to make a, a confession, so I will try to speed a bit through the slides and jump right in. So Daikin is a global 
company and our headquarter uh, is located in Osaka in Japan. Um, it was founded 1924, so we are ahead of a very exciting year. <laughs> and we all hope that uh, our 100 year anniversary is going to be uh, great. Um, the global turnover is 28 billion, but most of the global turnover is generated from the one of the most uh, prominent parts, which is usually the uh, AC business, and nowadays we also do heat pumps, uh, which is an important part. Um, overall, Daikin has almost 85,000 employees in 315 different companies, but uh, here in Europe we work on the Daikin Chemical Europe. Um, we also have some production sites in Europe, uh, Daikin Compounding Italy, uh, refrigerant recycling and also a production site for polymers in France. Um, but I personally work in the Daikin Innovation Center, which was opened in 2022. So just last year, uh, during the course of the Astrobat project, and in Europe we actually only started our R&D activities uh, together with the Astrobat project in 2019. Um, and then there's also an entity in the US. So um, the Daikin Chemical Europe Innovation Center, uh, I was mentioning before, is actually located in Dortmund, uh, in the west of Germany. Um, we now, since the opening, have 4,000 square meters of laboratory capacities and we work in four different um, fields. Um, so one of our interesting topics is surface modification, so screen modifications, sensors and everything. Um, electronics and automotive, so high voltage applications, coating of wires, um, electromotors and I have been working in the energy storage material. Um, one of the key points of the DCIC is that we are an open innovation center. So we actually do have uh, co-working spaces where our collaborators or startups can work together with us in the laboratory and actually do their science and their project ideas with us. And this is something we are actually very proud of and we always uh, want to want people to come to collaborate to our center and to work with us in the laboratory, not only in these type of sessions. So uh, generally our battery solutions um, range through a very wide area. Um, since we're a company that is focused on fluorine chemistry a lot, um, most of the things we do are targeted on high voltage applications. Um, but we also have materials, for example, for battery gaskets, um, where we do a very effective sealing uh, technology. Uh, then we have a variety of cathode uh, materials. We have a standard cathode binder additive that reduces scrap, improves uh, the compactability, uh, and we also have a, a new product that uh, is come, going to come to market very soon, which is a combination of this binder, of a fully formulated cathode binder, together with single wall carbon nanotubes uh, to improve the conductivity. Um, just recently, we started to work on cathode binders for dry processing, um, and there we are very active also in a lot of other research projects and try to bring dry process cathodes and also dry process anodes to market. Uh, and another part uh, that we are working on is effective electrolyte additives that uh, improve uh, cycle life, high voltage stability, or reduce flammability of liquid electrolytes. On the R&D side, um, we just heard a very interesting talk about uh, sulfide-based solid electrolytes. And in case you don't want to go for 100% sulfide, uh, we also work on binder solutions um, that help uh, um, for, with the solubility and that can be used, or the binders for dry process. Uh, there's uh, coating solutions for these sulfides that uh, reduce the H2S production and then the polymer electrolyte development that was done uh, within the Astrobat project is what I'm going to talk about today. And um, this is also the next part, so the, the results. First, uh, I think we've just seen this slide. It's the slide that regularly comes when you talk about electrolytes. Um, so here for this I um, took the ceramic, the polymer and the liquid part of these electrolytes apart. And of course, all three of them have different uh, pros and cons. Um, so ceramics, of course, they are non-flammable and they are great in terms of stability, but usually all the cells that are built with these solid electrolytes need, need high pressure to maintain the good electrode contact. And then we have the polymer, which we are, of course, working on a lot. 
and then the, they are great in terms of adaptability. They are easy to process. They are not very uh, expensive, but we all know that their ionic conductivity usually is not very good. So the cells that are used and built with polymer electrolytes usually work at high temperature. Um, in terms of lithium metal, then you also have this problem that there's no dendrite growth suppression because the mechanical properties of the polymers are not good enough. Uh, and then, of course, there's the standard liquids, um, which can be tailored very easily with all the additives. They are cheap. They are um, comparably good understood, but all of these pr uh, problems we are tackling within our projects to uh, get rid of the metal. So uh, the solution of all of the projects, I think, is that we are working on hybrids, and then you can think of all these different binary hybrids, uh, the, the gel types, the composite types, or the polymer and ceramic even. But the nice thing about the Astrobat project, I think, was that we are working on actually a multi-component hybrid, so we are thinking of all different components, uh, ranging from, in our case, it's a PVDF copolymer matrix, um, then the lithium salt plasticizer component that makes this uh, copolymer matrix uh, conductive in the end, and then we also use these uh, LSO fillers within our matrix to uh, imp increase the conductivity and improve all the other um, properties of the electrolyte system. So Daikin's contribution to this is the PVDF uh, copolymer electrolyte. Um, so we supply high voltage um, stable materials. Um, the adaptability I was mentioning before uh, can be easily tuned, can be used with very various solvents. And uh, one of the st strengths of the Daikin PVDF copolymer materials is that compared to other PVDF systems, we have uh, decreased glass transition temperature and uh, decreased crystallinity, which usually leads to increased ionic conductivities of these polymer electrolytes in the end. From the LSO side, which was uh, developed by uh, Fraunhofer IKTS, um, we were aiming to get the smallest uh, possible particle size. Um, the small particle size distribution is important for two different things. Uh, Sophie this morning presented that we were working on uh, printable electrodes and printable electrolyte systems, so small particle size is important. But it's also very important to have small particle size because the effect of these filler materials to the polymer electrolyte matrix is usually surface dependent. So a higher surface area leads to a better effect with lower usage of this uh, mass usage of this LSO particles, which reduces the price of the electrolyte system, and that helps us staying um, uh, below the 100 euro per kilowatt hour in the battery price in the end. Um, of course, the high ionic conductivity is important because we want to use the LSO particles as increase of, to increase ionic conductivity. And one thing we found during the project is that the absence of uh, surface passivation layers of the LSO is really crucial to get a reasonable increase in this ionic conductivity. So. Um, on the LSO free polymer electrolytes, um, I'd like to give a short introduction. Um, in the Astrobat project, we've been uh, trying uh, various formulations of the um, of the combination with of the PVDF copolymer, a lithium salt, and a plasticizer or solvent. So, within Astrobat, the plasticizer was usually an ionic liquid, as uh, Sophie presented this morning, and we were looking for all potential formulations that were yielding solid-state electrolyte systems. So, in the end, freestanding membranes. And you can see that we actually cover a relatively large variety of formulations with this. Um, so, the polymer matrix is. Uh, pretty good host for a lot of different combinations. Um, when we increase the pesticide content, we get reasonable ionic conductivities. And one of the real, really strength of these matrices is this uh, amazing high voltage stability that actually exceeds 4.5 volts quite a bit. Um, depending on the temperature, you can reach up to 6 volts electrochemical stability. Um, then. What we realized is that the half cells we were testing actually showed quite a good cyclability, but as is usual for polymer electrolytes, that uh, is that our dendrite growth suppression in the half cells wasn't good. And the reason for this is that we uh, actually have quite a sponge-like structure in the polymer electrolyte. So this is a, just an SEM image, and this is in uh, higher magnification of this. And you can really see how this polymer matrix 
uh, has a lot of holes, uh, which is caused by the formulation uh, here. Um, on the LSO side, um, the development was done by Fraunhofer AKTS, and I already mentioned some of the key parameters we were looking for in the two slides before. So uh, one of the targets was to produce high ionic conductivity materials, and that was solved by doping these uh, LSO particles. Um, Fraunhofer put an emphasis on processing all the synthesized LSO under ambient conditions. So that means um, it's not necessary to produce the LSO in a dry room atmosphere. What is important is that the surface layer passivation that uh, results through the ambient conditions uh, production afterwards is removed and they developed a heating procedure by checking different TGA protocols and then reheated the LSO particles that were produced afterwards to get rid of this surface passivation layer. Um, and then afterwards they developed different methods to reduce the particle size and get particle size distribution. Uh, one of the magic numbers in, within the project is this one micrometer because that's the particle size or the D90 which is necessary to produce printable electrolyte layers in the end, um, which was part of the project. And the work of combining these two components was then performed uh, in DCIC. Uh, and we started with this so we started with conventional mixing methods. It was very simple. We just put together the polymer matrix that we have developed the formulation before first and added the LSO particles. And yeah, you see it didn't work out as great. So we have quite some agglomerates and not a very good distribution of the LSO. Um, so we really had to start right from the beginning and had to develop mixing methods that in the end give the, uh, gave us this type of sheets where we have no LSO agglomeration and also no sedimentation of the LSO within the polymer electrolyte system in the end. Uh, so this was done first on very small scale with tiny um, uh, emulsifiers and then we went to very large batches uh, that were homogenized in the end. Um, and the film thickness of these films then is also tailorable um, with a suitable coating strategy. Um, you can get freestanding films with thicknesses below 50 micron that are mechanically stable. Um, so, of course, we were interested in increasing the LSO content because higher LSO content means uh, higher ionic conductivity. And then we gradually started um, and we found that a reasonable limit for the amount of LSO within these polymer electrolytes is around 30 weight percent. So with 30 weight percent we can still get freestanding films, um, but you can already see that the mechanical stability of these membranes is getting less advanced. And so at 40 percent or 35 percent this membrane is going to be too brittle to remove it from the tray. Um, which is a problem when you want to use the membrane as a freestanding membrane in the cell production process. Uh, until this 30%, we actually have reasonable mechanical stability that we tested also with dynamical mechanical analysis. Um, so this would still be possible to be used in a roll-to-roll -roll process, for example. And then, of course, the ionic conductivity is the ultimate goal. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but the, the KPI value for this ionic conductivity was 0.4 millisiemens. And uh, so after including these LSO particles, we were actually exceeding our KPI value um, quite a lot um, at various temperatures, um, which is pretty cool for, for us. Um, and then in the end, and now I'd like to give you an insight uh, of the things that come up during these projects. And one thing we have been realizing when we started coating the electrolytes on the cathodes that we were producing, that wet processed cathodes together with wet processed electrolytes, which are bo both based on PVDF polymers, is not an easy task because when we impregnate our electrolyte slurry into the cathodes, we, te we technically dissolve the binder system of the cathodes and then delaminate the cathode from the current collector. And that leads to very bad cycling um, behavior usually 
and um, also doesn't necessarily help with impregnation. So what we have started recently and uh, what we also fits very well within our uh, product landscape is that we now prepare dry processed electrodes with a PTFE binder. So um, PTFE has this amazing property that upon mechanical force the PTFE polymer chains entangle and form these nice fibers that are in the size range of a few hundred nanometers. And then you can have electrodes with very, very low binder content, but a very, very good uh, adhesion and cohesion between these particles. Um, also, you get rid of the uh, NMP, which is one of the great uh, drivers for CO2 footprint in cathode production and in energy consumption during uh, cathode production. And since PTFE is absolutely insoluble in most of the solvents, PVDF is soluble in, it's an amazing uh, alternative, and then the, in, uh, the intrusion process or the uh, impregnation process can be done on electrodes l large such as this without ever delaminating the electrode. So I'd like to thank uh, a few people uh, that uh, cannot be here today. Uh, the co-workers that have been working on the Astrobat project with me that are not with Daikin anymore, unfortunately. Um, some people from Fauna for IKTS, and if you have any questions, or if you want to work with us in the Daikin Chemical Europe Innovation Center, I would be very happy to host you. Uh, just write an email, uh, and we will be very happy to have you. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, if the two speakers can stay nearby, that would be great. So now we do have time for questions for our two speakers here. So do we have any questions? Yes? Oh, apparently I got my step goal. <laughs> I have a question for Daikin. How you can control the porosity of your uh, new dry process? So part of the dry processing is the calendaring step. And the calendaring is not standard calendaring, but it's shear calendaring. So, and by adjusting the shear during the calendaring, the porosity can be reduced or increased depending on what you, uh, what you have. So the dry process electrodes we are producing uh, can have thicknesses below 100 microns at the moment. Uh, and then we, we reach capacities so within this project around four milliamp hours per square centimeter. Hi, I uh, also have a question for you related to the PTIV that is being used in the dry processing, the dry coating. Do you see any risk with the new EU legislation banning these uh, type of PFAS? It, or is there an exemption for these type of applications? Well, in the current proposal, there is no exemption at all. Yeah. So, um, of course, there is a risk, but there is a risk for all fluoropolymers and all materials involved in battery. Uh, and I think it's part of the task of industry and academy and all the institutions like BEPA uh, together to inform all the relevant stakeholders that without an exemption we will have a lot of trouble in our energy transition. Thank you to both for, for the nice talks. So actually my questions are really aligned with uh, related to, to what you have been presenting. So, one is, so from the beginning, you were saying not only PTFE, so most of the polymers are based on highly fluorinated materials. So you mentioned that you are more on the part of looking for a kind of exception, but do you have, or do you, your company has a, a company towards the development of new type of polymers to go beyond this PFAS, or? I think it's not something that applies only to you. I think that this is applies to, to many people, and I think this is a hot topic currently. I think, yeah, so you're definitely right. And I think everyone is trying to find potential solutions in case their uh, PFAS material within batteries is banned. Um, so does Daikin, of course. Um, uh, but as I said, I think 
right now is a very early uh, point in time to discuss about alternatives um, when we're not even sure how the regulation landscape is, de is developing. Mm -hmm. okay. And a second question, if I can. So it's also related to the dry process. So you were saying that you can tune the, the porosity through the calendaring process. But I was wondering, since your hybrid material contains also a liquid component, is your liquid component already included in this process? Or it's not included in the dry process. Okay. So the liquid material is then part of the impregnation process. Okay. Yeah. We principally do then a standard solvent impregnation. Mm -hmm. And since the liquid material is either has a very high vapor uh, boiling point or uh, very low vapor pressure, in case of an ionic liquid is zero, uh, it's very simple to just remove the solvent and the liquid component stays inside the cathode. Okay. Thank you. Um, but if anyone else, please do feel free. Uh, so after the um, wet and dry processing, um, how, what challenges do you see with upscaling those processes? The wet processing looked to be like doctor blading, perhaps scalable, um, but what challenges do you see if, say, everything is successful, which we always hope they are, then where, where do you see the challenges lying there? Currently in Apple project, we can work for production of penicillin in uh, currently, we can work with wet chemistry process in the glow box. Um, however, for example, our pro uh, our partner from QV and AST work in the dry room. Yes, of course, it's a little bit complicated, especially for sulfate based because it's quite toxic materials. Um, but for Dr. Blood, yes, it's possible. That's actually, it's our, my presentation. If you can find some interaction between binder and solvents, you can receive quite nice, especially for stand film. Question is uh, if uh, you would like to build, for example, uh, line, yes, it's possible, but currently we can work as, uh, for small cells yeah. uh, for show like process uh, for like attractive this technology or not. But I know, for example, pulse line project currently we can work with uh, production for one ampere hour and ten ampere hour. So this is just one year of this project. I hope after three years <laughs> we can receive really um, power cell. So in general, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I suppose everything really is. <laughs> Another question. Sorry, Sarah. For yourself, Timo. Um, hang on, let me check. Do, do, do. Uh, yeah, the, I'm curious. You just say mixing method on one of your slides. Are you allowed to detail um, what methods you are actually using? Well, depends on the scale you're uh, thinking. As I said, we started with ver very small emulsifiers. So we work also on, as I said, on. Uh, screen protective technologies and so we do a lot of emulsification and we have a lot of different emulsification devices on lab scale in mm -hmm. the innovation center um, and for this particular um, film I was showing on the second but we used the homogenizer yeah. um, but on larger scale can also be other high shear mixing device and depending on what you're what scale you're looking at yeah. and so that's part of the developments we then do together with our customers they uh, come to us with their different steering, method, steering methods, and then we uh, try to make it work. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, there is a question online it's from my colleague from CA. Uh, he says, thank you for the very comprehensive presentation. And regarding electrolyte, up to which point is it considered solid when plasticizer and solvents are added? So I think there is this very uh, pretty description that comes from Wolfgang Janek, uh, who calls them almost solid. And I think this is a, a good idea. So we consider um, our electrolytes solid as long as they are able to form freestanding membranes. And when we are not able to get a freestanding membrane out, um, we consider them gel-like. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. I have just a short question. So how thin can you produce these layers? Uh, what, is there a minimum uh, border? 
well, depending on the formulation, of course. Um, and then at some point there's a trade-off between the mechanical stability and the ionic conductivity. Um, so the film thicknesses below 30 microns are possible for sure. There's also film thicknesses possible below 20 microns, but then we will have to change the formulation to a formulation that doesn't have the same great ionic conductivity that I was showing there. So it depends. Uh, in case you do not need a freestanding membrane, like in, in the last example I have been showing where we are actually able to coat the layers on top of the uh, of the electrode, then there is almost no boundary because you, you need no mechanical stability of the membrane itself for the production. And it's directly coated on the cathode, and the cathode will give you the mechanical stability. And the problem is that in the so in commercial cathodes or in standard produced cathodes, you will have difficulties with delam delamination. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, one, th thank you both, but my question about uh, sulf uh, sulfide electrolyte. So when you cast uh, slurry, I don't know how you call it, d do we need some like post-processing of this film? Calendaring or kind of um, compaction or, or it's just self-standing by itself? Thank you. Oh, usually, uh, yes, we need to densify to reduce for uh, at first thickness of and of course, you can if you can densify, you can reduce an interfacial resistance, increase ion conductivity. So, uh, actually, in our case, we can uh, we can do it. Uh, we produce a thin film. Afterwards, we can cut, for example, different size what you want. For example, ten millimeters, three, three, five, five, and so on. And afterwards, we can densify it, and with cathode materials, and put on lithium or indium, and that's it. Something like that. Because if you not densify, of course, it's ion conductivity quite. Of course, my more or less the same, but interfacial resistance is quite high. So you received quite poor and capacity fading of the cell in general. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? We do so have so much time. There's enough for one more if needed. Otherwise, uh, there's plenty of time for networking, so um, please join me thanking our first. Okay, so now we're uh, switching gears and moving from the electrolyte to the composite electrodes. Our first uh, speaker will now be Corson Bataglia from EMPA, based in Switzerland, and I will just draw up your presentation. And there we are, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you okay, so um, we are part of the Solidify project, which is coordinated by IMAC or by Amelia, I have to say. That she is really the, running the day-to-day -day business of uh, the, the project. And the results I'm presenting here is basically uh, from a paper that we published last year, which was a collaboration between EMPA and uh, Solvionic. Uh, maybe now you can hear me a little better. <laughs> and uh, actually, I will only talk about the 4-volt batteries, the 5-volt battery. In the interest of time, I took it out, but Lucy will uh, uh, show you these results tomorrow in her uh, presentation. Okay, so we are working on an electrolyte based on a polymerized ionic liquid. And we feel that uh, the advantage of these type of materials compared to the classic polymer holes is that the polycationic backbone is much less prone to strong lithium coordination. Um, ionic liquids have a tendency, depending on which ones you choose, but they have some available with uh, very high oxidative stability and they're also non-flammable. And so the objective of this work was to basically develop an electrolyte which is compatible with lithium metal at the same time um, as with NMC811 or even LNMO that Lucy will show you tomorrow. Um, basically, so we're not using a bilayer approach. Um, enables room temperature operations. Actually, it's not the requirement here. It's also not a requirement in the call text, but the results I'm showing you today is room temperature and uh, basically gives excellent cycling stability and high operational safety. And so we decided to work with this uh, pyrrolidinium cation 
and we use it in a polymerized version like it's shown here. So the pyrrolidinum can come in all kinds of different variations, different kind of functional groups, and there are different ways to polymerize it. But after it's quite some extensive screening, we uh, went for that one. Um, we use FSI as an anion, and um, unlike the TFSI, FSI is not subject to the PFAS regulation, so that's a good thing. Um, we actually chose that time FSI also because it has quite nice properties in terms of forming the SCI on the lithium metal surface. And so um, we also use lithium FSI as a salt and then basically pyrolidium FSI as a plasticizer. And uh, we have a bit the same definition as was just given before, that we call it solid, one you basically can handle it with tweezers and uh, you don't get wet hands. And uh, I'm just coming from a conference in Karlsruhe on polymer electrolytes where um, the, the same remark, well, remark was made that actually uh, we can call them actually solid polymer electrolytes as long as we can make freestanding films. And so this, that's how the films are uh, looking at. So we basically developed a, a C to nitrile based uh, solution casting process where we use 40% uh, by weight of polymer and 60% of uh, in per weight of ionic liquid. So it can really hold a lot of ionic liquid without, without wetting it. We try to also go higher, but then basically it becomes more some kind of a waxy material, very sticky, very hard to handle. So uh, this is kind of a good value for us. Uh, before you complain about the acetonitrile, I know this is also banned or will be banned soon. Uh, it's on the list of the substance of very high concern. Um, so basically, um, we developed an alternative process with a green solvent. We also applied for a patent for that uh, this time. I cannot disclose, disclose exactly what it is. But it also allows to make these uh, casted films, uh, which we can cast on a substrate. And basically, we peel them off. And that's how you see them, um, basically how we can handle them even with the gloves. Then thermal stability is quite good for these materials. So basically, it's uh, thermally stable up to 250 degrees. Um, also non-flammable up to direct flame exposure, as you can see here on this little movie. Then in terms of ionic conductivity, this really depends on what is the ratio now between the ionic liquid and the uh, um, polymer fraction. And when we are going all the way up to 40% a polymer by weight, we have an ionic conductivity of room temperature of about 0.8 millisiemens per centimeter. And of course, it would also help if you go to a slightly higher temperature, like 40 degrees, like Amelia mentioned before, to get even higher conductivity. Now, in terms of oxidative stability, uh, things look quite good as well. So in the inset on the right figure, you can see that uh, we make the linear sweep voltammetry much more carefully. So stability somewhere above 5 volts. Uh, so we, we rarely go that high. But uh, basically, we are cycling up to 5 volts when we do with LNMO and uh, have quite good stability. Um, and you can also see the stripping and plating of lithium is uh, quite reversible. Then um, these are basically lithium uh, symmetric cells. Uh, in this case, we cycle them at 0.1 milliamp per centimeter square uh, with a charge of 0.1 milliamp per hour per centimeter square, um, so basically one hour per cycle. You can see uh, the overpotential is quite stable, and also you can see from the impedance, initially we don't have a good contact because basically we are just transferring the film um, basically once it's peeled off onto the um, lithium metal. Um, but basically after a few cycles, you can see basically the uh, interfacial resistance drops quite quickly and stays low, uh, which is interesting and is what we want. And you can also see in green is the values when we increase the current density to 0.5 milliamps per centimeter square. So I remind you this is still at room temperature, so we have higher values depending on what temperature we use and what pressure we apply, uh, we can go even higher. Then um, we also found that when we just uh, use a membrane um, between the two lithium, um, there is some lithium um, dendrite formation. So you see basically we go to 1,200 hours or 800 hours in the, in the second case. And in this case, we increased the amount of charge that we're cycling uh, per cycle. So we went all the way up to 1 milliamp per hour. Uh, per centimeter square per cycle, so 10 times more charge transfer per cycle. And we realized that if you are using a porous separator between the two and we infiltrate it with the electrolyte, that uh, thanks to the tortuosity um, of the separator, we can actually delay the onset of lithium dendrite formation quite a bit. And you can see we have actually here 1,700 hours reported, not cycles, hours, uh, sorry for that. Um, and this cell has actually been still cycling, so at some point I think uh, um, Chengeng just took it off the cyclers because he felt like he needs a channel. Then um, we also integrated this electrolyte into a full cell uh, where we use NMC811 as a castle material. Uh, you can see on the left the stack, so lithium metal on top, relatively stick seal. Then the separator, the uh, polymerized ionic liquid, the ionic liquid um, 
plasticizer and the NMC811 electrode, which is also infiltrated with the uh, electrolyte or mix in this case. Uh, you don't see the nice NMC811 particles. Uh, these are ion beam cuts, and this brings quite a lot of energy into the system, and we feel that it's, it's basically reflowing. And so what you see here is this kind of uh, pattern. Uh, we believe these are actually fragments from the NMC particle that were um, ion beamed away, and so basically are lying around there in this mass. Uh, but you can see basically very nice uh, compact interfaces. So from that uh, point of view, we can also expect some good results from the cycling stability. And so these are cycling results on the cells. The aerial capacity is on the order of one milliamp per hour per centimeter square that we have on the cathode site. Um, we cycle them up to 4.4 volt and 4.6 volts. And you see we have a, quite a good capacity retention. So 92% after 120 cycles to 4.4 volt and even 84% uh, still uh, after 120 cycle at 4.6 volts. And we use the same trick again. So there we don't have the separator inside that, um, which but basically all these cells will die, will die a few cycles later because of the dendrites. Uh, it's the same, roughly the same amount of charge that has been cycling. And so you can see when we use the separator, we can extend this quite a bit. So we are at 600 cycles here with a capacity retention of 72%, giving an overall coulombic efficiency of 99.9% .9 or even a bit better. Then maybe some other recent events what we have been working on. So until now, this was basically the status like one year ago. And so we made some quite uh, significant advances also to reach the targets in the project. So uh, we are going to thicker um, cathodes, uh, larger than five million per hour per centimeter square. So we have two partners in our consortiums that work on these. One is Fraunhofer that developed this kind of uh, infiltration process into this kind of uh, carbon um, fiber um, current collectors. The other one Amelia had cited on her slide, I'm sorry I don't have it here, but uh, it's from TU Delft, which is a solvent um, exchange uh, process yeah, where they also can make very thick electrodes. Um, then the other critical thing that we've been working on uh, in our work package is to reduce the amount of lithium that we are using. So what I've showed you before was 200 micron thick lithium, so this is terrible for commercial projects, not really safe. And so we are now using 20 microns and have uh, results uh, at least comparable to the one uh, I showed you before. So this is quite a challenge in terms of the Coulombic efficiency. It doesn't look like much, but uh, you have to be much more economic using your lithium. And we have also a much lower um, separator thickness, so we're down to 15 microns at the moment. And so basically, uh, with this, we should be able to reach the 450 watt hours per kilogram. Um, that's the summary. I leave it just as this in the interest of time, but I would like to thank all, all the people that have been involved here um, from the Ampa and Solvionic side for this work. As everything is published in the paper that you have to reference as well. We have another paper in review. Um, so if you get it as a reviewer, I hope, uh, please be nice to it. <laughs> it has been a lot of work. And um, yeah, so I would also thank uh, Amelia for um, coordinating the whole project. So thank you. Thank you very much, Corson. Excellent. So again, please, we will have a Q&A after two more talks. So keep your questions with you, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask them. Uh, so thank you again, Corson. So now, of course, uh, we have um, Astrobat being represented uh, by Johan Odart from uh, Nanomakers. And I'll just swap over the presentations. And then the floor will be yours. Where are we? And online, if the um, wider screen hasn't worked, please. It's all good? Perfect. Great. OK. The floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. So hello, everybody. So I'm Johan Uda from Nanomakers, and we are part of uh, Astrobat project. And so I will uh, introduce the silicon for solid state batteries. And then it will be followed by a presentation of uh, Gwen on the specific results for Astrobat project. So um, uh, Nanomakers um, is a startup um, which is quite uh, quite young, and uh, we are a spin-off of the CEA uh, from uh, the site uh, near Paris in Saclay. And um, we are using a technology which has been developed at the CEA, which is called laser pyrolysis. And uh, this, uh, this technology enables the formation of uh, unique uh, silicon-based nanoparticles. And uh, those particles um, has a very narrow particle size distribution, and um, they are very good uh, in terms of uh, purity and qualified for the semiconductor industry. 
And um, uh, since, uh, since the beginning of Nanomakers, we have scaled up the process up to 40 tons now. And uh, we can, uh, we can uh, supply um, so large quantities of, of materials. So we have two types of products. Uh, the first family is silicon carbide, so mainly for the semiconductor industry. Uh, it's mainly used as a filler for elastomers. Uh, we have different sizes available, different uh, coatings, uh, different types of doping and purity. Um, but for batteries, uh, we have another family, which is the silicon family, of course. And um, we have uh, different products. Uh, the two main families are pure silicon particles, and the other one is uh, carbon-coated silicon particles. Uh, different sizes are available, and our particles are fully crystalline, which is important to have some, uh, some good stability uh, in water slowly, especially. So, um, <coughs> um, uh, silicon has a very good capacity uh, compared to the most popular material for the anode, which is graphite. So, graphite has a capacity of about uh, 350, 375 milliampere hour per gram. Um, now, uh, silicon oxide uh, is, uh, is used since many years by some car manufacturers, especially uh, Tesla. And um, so it can, uh, it can improve the capacity of the anode up to 4, 425, 450 milliampere hour per gram. And um, the next generation uh, will be a silicon metal as the anode. So pure silicon has a capacity which is 10 times higher than graphite. But uh, today, uh, it can be used um, pure. It, it has to be diluted um, <coughs> with, uh, with uh, other species. And uh, the, the most popular one is uh, graphite. So then uh, you, have, uh, you have the anode, which is uh, quite similar to standard anode um, with uh, active material, which is micrometric or, or, or mix of sizes, uh, additives, binder, and um, the everything on the current collector. So um, <coughs> silicon has some challenges in batteries. Uh, maybe most of you are, are aware of this, but uh, anyway, I will remind it. Um, <coughs> so doing uh, silicon has a very high capacity. Um, but uh, when, uh, when we form an alloy between lithium and silicon, there is a huge expansion of the silicon, which is uh, close to three times in volume. And so uh, with big particles, uh, you doing this swelling, uh, you have some pulverization and some quacking of the particles. And after a few cycles, you have a lot of small particles in the anode and you lose the contact with the other materials of the anode. And so then you, you lose capacity. So uh, um, when, uh, the best way to solve this problem is to have nanometric particles. Uh, it has been shown by many studies studies that below 150 nanometer, uh, the silicon particles have an elastic behavior, so it's not anymore uh, quacking. And so then you, you form an alloy uh, which is stable uh, in, in, in volumes from one cycle to, to another. Then, uh, as you have small particles, particles you have a quite high surface area. And so then the, the problem is the SEI formation. And so for, um, for this, we have developed, developed uh, for mainly for uh, liquid state batteries, but also uh, it, it can be used in solid state batteries, um, a carbon coated silicon. And um, this layer around the, the silicon uh, prevent uh, a large part of the detrimental SEI formation uh, reactions. And so you have better stability uh, during cycling and uh, you have better compatibility with uh, uh, the binders and the carbon species. So um, <coughs> well, uh, quite an easy way to use uh, uh, silicon in, in anodes is, um, is to, to use a binder, carbon additives or overs, a solvent, graphite, so really like uh, to prepare uh, ink, which is, very, which is the, the main one for, for, for standard batteries. And you can just add nano silicon in the slurry. You, can, you should adapt, of course, the, the, the viscosity, but it can be used quite readily. And uh, uh, if you use from one to 5% silicon, then you, you can uh, still have some, uh, some good um, irreversible Coulombic efficiency, so higher than uh, 90%. Uh, and uh, you can uh, reach uh, quite long cycling, so several hundreds of cycles. 
um, at a silver free uh, with, uh, with standard carbonate electrolytes. So um, <coughs> we, for solid state batteries, uh, the approach can be uh, quite similar. Uh, instead of having a binder, you have an electrolyte. So different processes can be used. It can be uh, with a solvent, with a solvent, but the approach can be the same. And um, uh, silicon is a, a very good candidate for solid state batteries. Um, so there is uh, lithium, which is widely studied, but uh, silicon is, has a, a good, uh, good potential also um, because um, uh, the electrolyte is very different from carbonate, so the surface reactions are quite different and, and we can expect them to be more stable. Uh, the capacity is, of course, much higher than for graphite, and there is no dendrite formation, which is the case for, for lithium. And also, uh, it's much more easier to handle than uh, lithium foils, also. <coughs> so, um, we, have, uh, we have made some, some studies, and we have uh, proven uh, the concept of uh, compatibility of silicon with different types of materials, so with oxide, like LLZO, with polymers, and with sulfurs. So uh, I show here some results with uh, argyrodite, um, which is the most popular sulfur electrolyte. And um, so you can see that uh, you can have some, some, some quite good stability uh, with 12% silicon and carbon. When you add some graphite, of course, the capacity is uh, increased a little bit and the stability quite similar. And then uh, when you increase again uh, the capacity with 30% silicon, the, the, the overall capacity is, of course, higher, but the stability is, is less good. And uh, well, this is only first results. And uh, what, uh, what, what we have also observed is that we don't reach the full capacity of the material uh, due to the electrolyte, which uh, prevents the, the, the access of, uh, uh, because the conductivity is too low. And, uh, and so there was, uh, uh, in those tests, there was a quite high limitation due to the electrolyte. Um, but to develop a new material uh, for the anode, uh, the interest of silicon is that you can tune the material and uh, tune the interaction with, uh, between the silicon and the electrolyte in order to, to optimize the, the anode formulation. Um, so in brief, uh, silicon has a very high capacity, but uh, it, it should be used in limited amount to have a, to have a, a good cyclability. Uh, the nanosilicon is very important to avoid swelling, but then you have to, <coughs> to solve the issue of uh, SEI formation. And um, so it's partly solved by the carbon protection around silicon. And for, for solid state batteries, there is a huge potential to, to, have, um, to, to play a new interaction and to, to avoid detrimental SEI formation. And so um, our silicon is available in quite large quantities. It's, uh, it can also uh, be easily scalable for large amounts to, to supply uh, gigafactories. And uh, also, quite important, um, we can tune our silicon and adapt it to uh, each specific electrolyte. So um, now uh, Gwen uh, will, um, will present some results uh, obtained in Astrabad project uh, with, uh, with silicon and uh, the, the electrolyte developed uh, within this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So again, we just have one more talk. Uh, already very nicely introduced, we have Gwen here, Gwen Giffen. And uh, I will just load your presentation. It was a PDF, wasn't it? It's a PowerPoint, but I just okay. think you want like an hour ago. Oh yeah, perfect. I think we're already there. We're... Yes, here we go. Sorry, one more step. We should be okay. Okay, thank you very much, Gwen. Thank you very much. So I am also going to talk, as Johan just mentioned, uh, about silicon anodes um, that we developed in the Astrobot project. So I'm not going to go into detail here. I'd just kind of like to point out, as Sophie also mentioned this morning, in Astrobot we were looking at a dual polymer system. The catholite polymer came from Daikin, as Timo presented a little earlier. And then uh, on the anode side, unlike the other projects, we've been using silicon, and we've also been using a polymer that has been developed at our institute, Fraunhofer ISC. 
So, our polymer system, it's known as a hybrid organic and organic polymer electrolyte. So it's a curable electrolyte. Uh, this means we can basically do all sorts of processing steps in the liquid state. Uh, you can kind of imagine it as, let's say, a rather uh, thin honey or, I mean, the viscosity depends on the specific uh, functional groups. Um, you have here in the middle, there's our pointer, you have here in the middle the inorganic part. Uh, it's based on siloxane chemistry, so you have the SEO2 uh, backbone. And then this siloxane is functionalized with ether groups, uh, which you see here. So this is really an idealized structure. Of course, it's uh, much more random. And then in terms of processing, you take this pre-polymer that is in the liquid state, you add the electrolyte, uh, you add an ionic liquid, if you want it, uh, we have tried both within the project and our final formulations are using the ionic liquids. And then you need finally uh, an initiator to do the thermal curing. Um, of course, these polymers can also be UV cured, but for in the anode itself, um, we've been using thermal curing to deal with the challenges of UV and carbon. Okay, so basically you can see that as Corson mentioned a minute ago, this is also a solid electrolyte, even though it does have a liquid in it. You can have here a nice flexible membrane. Um, however, we generally don't make freestanding films, not for the reason that we can't, but for the reason of, um, in terms of processing, it's a lot easier for us to process in the liquid state, do infiltration, and then cure to have a good interface without actually laying a membrane uh, on the next component. So, um, in terms of conductivity, uh, depending on the formulation, we can kind of tailor the conductivity. So we've also reached uh, the KPI of one, so basically 10 to the minus four millisiemens per centimeter. That was basically the goal of all of these projects in terms of conductivity. In terms of transference number, uh, it really depends on whether or not we have an ionic liquid in the polymer itself or not. Uh, this is also known for most of the different polymer electrolyte chemistries. Um, but here with FSI and uh, the ionic liquid, we're about somewhere about 0.15 in terms of transference number. Um, I do want to mention this is all at about a ratio of 20 to one in terms of ether oxygens to lithium. Um, later in the project, we've actually increased this conductivity, or sorry, increased uh, the amount of lithium in the polymer with almost no change in conductivity, but a significant increase in transference number. So in terms of function of the cell, this has been uh, a big step for us. So that's sort of the polymer electrolyte part. Now we're gonna shift into the composite electrode part. So as I mentioned, we have the benefit of we're using a precursor that's in the liquid state. This is a little bit like the materials that uh, were talked about in terms of solidifying. Um, and so what you have here is you have the ability to use conventional electrodes. So we were using pure silicon electrodes using the nanomaker silicon. We can make these electrodes using a conventional aqueous process. So we don't need any other sort of solvents or things like that. Then what we do is after we have the finished electrode, we can basically coat our polymer electrolyte precursor directly on the surface. This infiltrates into the pores of the anode itself, and then we can do our ther thermal curing process. And so with that, we have basically a solid composite electrolyte at the end. Now, you might say, okay, infiltration, does that really work? Does it go all the way into the electrolyte? Um, we've been able to prove that. Uh, so here you can see basically the uninfiltrated uh, electrolyte, or sorry, electrode on the left. These were uh, with loadings of about one milliamp per square centimeter on the top. Um, of course, we do want to move towards higher loadings. And so we also did this for a two milliamp per hour um, per square centimeter uh, electrode on the bottom. And so here you can see this is the infiltrated electrode. This is just uh, an SEM cross section. And then you have the EDX mapping on the right side. And so this is the fluorine mapping. The, we can't use silicon as a probe here because of course we have silicon in both 
the composite electrode itself and in the polymer. So we've used fluorine as the probe and you can see here the high concentration of the basically the overcoating of the electrolyte of the fluorine and then the complete distribution of fluorine all the way down to the current collector itself. So even though we do have a material that's rather viscous, um, we are able to infiltrate that all the way down to the current collector and then we can cure it within uh, the composite electrode itself. Here's some of the uh, performance data. So this is in half cells, so silicon, uh, silicon composite polymer electrolytes against lithium metal. Um, we're getting here, so we did limit this capacity in the cycling to about 200 milliamp hours per square centimeter. So that's why you're not really seeing anything up here around 3000 or so. We've limited this from the beginning. Um, and then based on the different electrolyte composition, you have different performances. So for example, with LIFSI, we had a really stable system, but it was relatively limited in terms of uh, the loading of the electrodes that we could actually get capacity out of, and in also in terms of the rate. Um, so here you see, as soon as we went from a relatively low loading to even a little bit higher without ionic liquid, we basically had no capacity left. And so basically in the end, we have a trade-off between the best usable capacity, capacity retention, and columbic efficiency. And so this is why for the, basically the rest of the studies and the rest of the project, also, of course, we need to combine our electrolyte with that from Daikin, and uh, that we move towards this LIFSI uh, ionic liquid system. What was particularly interesting, and we hadn't really thought of at the beginning, uh, was we were really able to have a quite wide, wide range of silicon content in the electrode. So we started and did all of the initial studies with 50%, really high amounts of binder, really high amounts of carbon black. And as we moved through the project, particularly in the beginning phases, we were able to see we could go up to almost 85% of silicon and still have reasonably good performance. Um, and that we sort of had an optimum in terms of here the 75%, 15%, and 10. And so this is then also uh, the electrode that we tried to take through the rest of the project, or we did take through the rest of the project. Okay, so basically what have we actually achieved? Well, we have a hybrid polymer. It's highly flexible. It has a relati relatively high conductivity. Um, we have a relatively easy method to prepare the silicon anodes. So we have a conventional electrode process, an aqueous electrode process that we can then post infiltrate. So this should be something that's relatively easy to scale uh, to a roll to roll process. And uh, at least at this point, this is still a little bit earlier. We have of course done this in a full cell by now. Um, we validated this performance in half cells and also now in full cells, although I haven't showed you the data. Um, the challenges that still have to be uh, more or less solved, our rate capability is still not quite where it should be. The columbic efficiency is also uh, still not quite sh where it should be, but these are things, of course, that we're working on and also why we probably clearly need another funding round for these solid state calls. I think all of the projects would agree with this because there still are a lot of challenges that we have to solve. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Yes, yes, please, if you can. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Really fantastic talk. So now we do have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, yeah, if I kindly ask the speakers, that Yolanda's got uh, the other microphone there. Uh, so do we have any questions for our speakers? Yes, yeah, oh, sorry. Question, why do you need this impregnation step? And why you cannot prepare all in one pot? It will be easier in one process. It, it <laughs> is, I can imagine it would be easier in one process. We thought this at the beginning. This was actually the very first thing we did as we said, okay, we're gonna try a one-step synthesis or not one-step synthesis, but a one-step preparation in terms of um, the cathode. Uh, we were able to get cathode or oh, anodes talking about anodes today. <laughs> uh, 
we were able to get anodes. We were able to cycle them a little bit, um, but the performance really wasn't where we wanted it to be. Um, and as we moved towards this infiltration process, the performance was simply much, much better. And so that's why we moved away from the one pot process. Thank you to three of you. My question is also <laughs> maybe because it was the, the last the last one presenting. So I'm curious about so following the question from, from Andre. So you are doing this infiltration, so then you will have a, an in situ jellyfied electrode, uh, in this case anode. Mm -hmm. And and then do you apply the same process for the cathode? And do you prepare the electrolyte separately or how is the overall manufacturing of, of So basically we have um We've developed a process where we have uh, an anode that's infiltrated, not cured. We have a cathode uh, that's infiltrated, and then basically we can laminate the two together and uh, cure to have a single unit. Okay, so then you do not apply another layer as electrolyte, so it's going to be like the excess, let's say, that remains on the top of both electrodes, the electrolyte. Yeah, you could. Uh, and this was certainly one of the things that we did look uh, at within the project. Um, but in terms of the final prototype cells, um, we've gone with the simpler setup of simply the two electrolytes, uh, yeah, more or less laminated and cured on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks to three of you for the presentations. I have. Uh, some question, well, one question for the regarding the electrolyte stability that you have present for 4.5 uh, volts. They were 4.6. What about uh, 5 volts? You were saying that, that there are also some other examples. Uh, are these electrolytes stable up to 5 volts? Or? Actually, I mean, we use the same electrolyte and cycle it with LNMO. And LNMO will, you know, basically up to 5 volts. The plateau is a 4.9. And uh, you will see the results tomorrow in Lucy's presentation. Thank you very much for the nice talks. I have uh, two questions. Uh, basically, for the silicon, uh, I also worked with the silicon anode in the past and just recently published a paper. So with the sulfide electrolyte, uh, we, we, we decided to use micron-sized silicon because uh, we noticed that with the micron-sized silicon, the conducti electrical conductivity is much higher. Then you don't need any carbon additive, any electrolyte, nothing. Uh, so you can have an uh, electrode made of 99% uh, silicon and then 1% uh, binder, and it works. So you get you put it in contact with the uh, with the electrolyte, and it works. So my first question is, uh, why you decide for nano silicon while micro silicon works in uh, solid state batteries? And my second question is with this ionic liquid. So it works very nice. It is. It's perfect, uh, what uh, course in, uh, you, uh, you showed. But uh, just the question is on the cost, so if it makes sense at the end to, to upscale them. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. I don't use silicon, so I think that those Yeah, are I guess the you. silicon question <laughs> is to me, although maybe I refer the silicon question to Johan. <laughs> yeah, it's true that there are some nice results with micro silicons. Uh, but uh, to, to usually to, to reach very long cycle stability, uh, the nano is usually better. So uh, it's, it's always a matter of formulation. And also one important topic is the full cycling of silicon or not. Uh, because sometimes uh, micro silicon is, is used uh, not at its full capacity. And uh, like this, we can have very nice stability with micro silicon. But then you have a large dead volume, I would say, of silicon. And so uh, if you want to use all the silicon, then it's, uh, it's recommended to use nano-sized silicon. Is your silicon dope? No. Can you dope it or it's non-dope? It's non-dope. We can dope, but for the moment, we have not seen any interesting effect. Uh, there was a second question. Yeah, on the cost. Um, actually, I had the cost on the slide. Uh, but I think I will also refer to Lucy's talk tomorrow, uh, who, who will show you about the scaling and, and the cost projections. But uh, it's basically $80 uh, 
um, per kilogram we had, right? So on the slide, yeah, exactly. So that's uh, the cost. And I mean, I mentioned it also yesterday at a conference. We had, I mean, independent of Solidify, we had once discussions with Samsung and said you have to get the electrolytes below $100 per kilogram. And then it starts to become interesting for us because, you know, a commercial electrolyte is, Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe $8 <coughs> or so or $10 per liter. And so that factor, the remaining factor of 10, they, they think by scaling it really to large volumes that they can get it out. So I think we are in a range where it's, uh, you know, cost-wise uh, competitive, yeah. Uh, I have another question related to the uh, silicon nanoparticles and you know, uh, the nanomaker silicon particles, more specifically the carbon coated ones. Were these specific particles evaluated? And perhaps the question is twofold. On the one hand, um, is the carbon conformally coating the silicon? And does the carbon coating prevent the expansion of the silicon? Or are you also limited uh, in the terms of uh, capacity utilization of the silicon anode because of the carbon coating? Um, no, so the, the silicon uh, is, uh, is uh, well dispersed around the particles, so it's homogeneous, and then it doesn't prevent the swelling because it's too thin, and uh, so, uh, so, it's, um, so doing the swelling, uh, the surface changes, and then uh, the, the carbon coating is, is, uh, is a bit complex. But so our credo, our motto is to, to have a full use of the silicon. Otherwise, uh, you, you have a... Uh, like um, uh, a reserve of silicon which is not used and we c which will introduce uh, um, in, in a full cell, uh, we, we, which will consume lithium again and again and then you will lose capacity. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question about the ionic liquid. Uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, the cycling was at room temperature or at and they're like, uh, at was at room temperature. Yeah, everything I showed was at room temperature. Yeah. Okay. Except uranium salt, right, which goes to room temperature. And uh, what was the ionic conductivity? Some, if you one have. One eight um, millisieverts per centimeter. So almost one millisieverts per centimeter. Okay, thank you. of this topical session. Uh, okay, so uh, now we have two talks, I think myself included. Um, so, but to begin with, so this is the solid state battery manufacturing theme. Uh, sorry, before we begin though, can we please thank our speakers from the Composite <laughs> Electrodes. Okay, so then first up we have uh, Andre Kwasha. Uh, from Cedar Tech, and this is representing the Safely Move project. I'll just make sure. Uh, this one. Yeah, usually just these keys here, yeah. Yep, you should be able to use a laser pointer there. Okay, and then, yeah, you're good to go. The floor okay. is yours. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, uh, thank you for giving the opportunity to explain what we are doing in Safely Move, and in particular in CDTEC. Also, I'm very excited to participate in this event because it's really, you can visualize uh, how big uh, solid state, uh, European solid state battery community. This looks like some separated projects. And here today, <coughs> in, in my presentation, uh, there are two parts. Uh, one part I will very briefly introduce CDTEC. Uh, what is this? Maybe some of, some of you you don't know. Just on, uh, and then uh, of course we will go to safely move experience. Uh, 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 it will be like rather than concrete results. It's more like uh, reflections about what we got and uh, overall project. So so here is outline and uh, CDTEC is uh, energy storage is part of CDTEC that we have uh, we are located in north of Spain uh, San, San Sebastian Basque region and we are composed by three centers uh, surface engineering nanomedicine and uh, energy storage that I belong to this um, and all located in San Sebastian 
So we we are working in uh, in energy storage with uh, different type of uh, let's say projects. We work with industry, we work in Europe, we work with national programs, uh, startups, uh, and different type of profiles. And also we have our own uh, let's say uh, generation of knowledge, and uh, we work on uh, new technologies, especially in new chemistries like solid state, lithium sulfur, etc. Uh, for example, if we are talking about uh, uh, technological scope, what we are doing, we have uh, several lines, uh, advanced lithium ion, solid state, lithium sulfur, sodium ion, and divalent uh, batteries, zinc, magnesium, calcium. So today I will be focused on solid state battery result, but if you have any question or regarding all these lines, so just drop me a mail or we can talk. Uh, the CDTEC is a technological center. We are not university. That's why we need the uh, muscles, like a lot of equipment. And in principle, we our slogan is from powder to power. So we can start from NMC or ionic liquid or lithium salt and end up with uh, cells and even with module. And here you have some examples of uh, uh, equipment that we have. We have possibility to assemble inside the dry room cells outside uh, for coating same so it's like we are well equi equipped and it's just for, for information what, what, we, what we have also of course without uh, testing capabilities impossible to develop something and also participate in some projects and we got uh, quite uh, big uh, testing facilities uh, uh, starting from very small coin cells uh, and uh, ending up with for example walk-in chamber of 30 cubic meters that you can introduce car with passenger it is joke <laughs> yeah and do whatever you want thermal shock etc and all this uh, uh, now it's located uh, like 10 kilometers from San, Se San Sebastian but uh, soon it will be in in one place and uh, we have a lot of channels and so on so we are very like uh, we are working in applied part of battery technology and uh, that's why when you see the, my next slides you will understand why I put like this well, I hope so le let's go to safely move projects again I think it's very very interesting projects uh, very interesting project challenging so it makes that you cannot relax <laughs> this project because targets are really like very um, challenging but we are trying to do our best to, to get it and here some like results on this. So first, first is regarding. I think uh, many times we are like we are focused on details and we forgot about vision or concepts or baselines. And first, uh, when we develop uh, technology, or finally cell technology, we should understand that the the wall is more than sum of parts. So you have good electrolyte, you have good uh, cathode, anode, whatever you have good. But then, if there is no way to put all together in one system, uh, it will not work. That's why it's very important to, to think about many other factors than just uh, simple chemical compatibility or another, let's say, academic-like uh, considerations. And in these projects, we had to do, maybe today I cannot disclose everything, but we had to do a lot of this uh, work in order to make it work together. Uh, Maria and during morning session explained you a little bit uh, about the project uh, and uh, today uh, since I have like uh, this talk about uh, cell, uh, manufacturing of solid state I will uh, use only one example because I will not uh, spend time for, for these two phases only about the latest phase that we are, that we are more advanced and what we are doing here, and uh, especially I will be focused on what is like CDTEC uh, responsibility, assembly, <coughs> let's say development and assembly one ampere hour cell with advanced material. So here you can see very simplified uh, scheme of uh, how, we, uh, how we see cell assembling process. Uh, simplified because we removed all conditions, we I remove all uh, points
sense that, let's say, for example, at each step we have quality check, uh, control, etc. Because otherwise it will be like super busy and possible to see. And uh, in this um, uh, chart, we have several blocks. One is a cathode uh, electrode uh, preparation, anode, a lithium metal, solid electrolyte. Uh, in this project, we call this HSCP. And uh, of course, uh, final cell assembly. The, the appearance of the cell of our target cell is this one, it's stack size five by six, and it's very simple power cell design. Here we don't focus, we don't develop really battery, battery. We develop, let's say, uh, proof of concept cell that later uh, engineers in next projects can take and make from this real product. Uh, and uh, it's very important that because this uh, format is very flexible. So if we start to discuss, uh, let's say, uh, uh, cell manufacturing process, uh, cathode preparation. To, today Maria mentioned that uh, preparation or manufacturing of cathode with high loading for solid state batteries, what does it mean? You need catalyte, uh, zero porosity, and uh, um, this catalyte should have like certain conductivity. So the finally, you should play with, uh, with a lot of things and uh, thinking about scalability. Because our concept was from the beginning not to use uh, something very uh, exotic. So use what we have at CDTEC and adapt it to solid state battery technology. So then that's why we, we bet on, we selected on slurry based uh, process. But it is not slurry that everything will be evaporated. Here you need to evaporate part of components and uh, only solvent uh, will leave the slurry. And the other liquids, uh, like plasticizer, etc. here. So basically we prepare here uh, slurry. We uh, at different scale. Then we use slurry, slurry uh, casting method uh, using roll to roll um, uh, base coaters. Uh, uh, then, when we have this roll, we have a uh, calendaring process, and then after this, uh, uh, we have this roll of calendaring electrode that uh, still has certain like porous. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can use this. Uh, you, you, uh, then uh, we need one uh, post-processing step. Uh, in our case, hot pressing. And then after that, uh, up and after drying, we can use these electrodes with porosity. Uh, uh, it's below 10%, but still, I mean, we, we need to improve, but without hot pressing step, it's impossible to get uh, high performance uh, electrode. Next step is solid electrolyte preparation. Here we use, uh, with help of uh, short and uh, mainly sick energy gune, we use a <coughs> double layer coated electrode. So one side we coat with uh, polymer, uh, let's say, uh, of separator, uh, because we learned from previous, uh, if you want conductivity, you, uh, you lose mechanical properties, and I think uh, the solution that we um, proposed by CIC here uh, use uh, polymer uh, microporous separator uh, from, I mean, very standard in, in this case. Uh, it, it, it is very interesting idea because finally it, it can, I mean, uh, it much easier to scale, scale. So first we code one side, then we perform cross-linking, then we code the second side of separator uh, using um, uh, um, a LATP based uh, uh, solid electrolyte uh, formulation. Then, after cross linking, uh, we have uh, self standing film that we don't post process uh, uh, by the moment. And uh, this uh, solid electrolyte is used uh, uh, in, uh, for cells. And uh, important to mention, for example, this process we perform fully in dry room. A cathode we perform almost all uh, outside. Then uh, lithium, here uh, we have luck to have on board Hydro-Quebec with their enormous capability to produce uh, lithium foil and uh, what we receive from them, lithium. And then we uh, cut this type of electrodes. Process is very simple because we don't use uh, copper foil because copper foil penalizes a lot of uh, energy density. So then we, we uh, a bet on, on, on our choices uh, without current collector because with 40 micron 
we consider it can work without copper. Yeah. Then uh, this is a stacking process. Here you, you, you see one example. So basically, uh, in order to uh, reduce amount of elements, what we do is we uh, use a lithium anode and uh, uh, let's say laminated uh, cathode in solid electrolyte. So in, in this case, instead of three elements, or actually four elements for one cell, you have only two. So it's a simplified process. By the moment, it is a manual assembly, but uh, we, we consider in future we can do. Then we stack six anodes, seven anodes, uh, six cathode, seven anodes. We have this final stack. And then we seal and uh, test uh, uh, by the moment at 60 degree, but uh, under pressure. And we use a, a pseudo constant volume condition. So it is very simple because uh, I mean, pressure is good, uh, control is good, but it should be also feasible solutions. You cannot apply to have one machine that serving like all constant pressure. So that's why we, we are trying to simplify and find solution that can be done once. For example, you, you place cell in jig and this work. So here is the scheme, what, what we do. Queso, mm, anode, enters solid electrolytes, stacking, tub welding, packaging, sealing. Then we have uh, final power cell, and uh, we're introducing and start testing. <coughs> Here, of course, in e every step, we control uh, quality, so quality geometrical, um, let's say thickness, weight, OCV, um, resistance, whatever, uh, in order to reduce amount of let's say, bad cells that can be po possibly don't, don't, don't work. And here uh, you can see result. It's a very recent result uh, uh, with uh, generation to cell. So basically, uh, you saw comparison in Maria's slides uh, about this. But here is just to say that it's uh, one ampere hour cell working at C over 10 and C over 10 in this uh, uh, voltage range. And here. Uh, you see some characteristic, for example, in Maria slide, the uh, values are higher because it is comparison with lower C rate and higher, uh, wider uh, cycling range. But I think this property is uh, quite promising and we know what we have to do in order to improve this technology. So basically increase more loading, decrease thickness of electrolyte and other, uh, let's say, considerations. Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, if we go to conclusions, um, first, uh, uh, solid state batteries are, are is promising class of batteries and potentially can bring high energy density, uh, safety should be proved and uh, durability, but manufacturing is a problem and will affect the cost of, of this technology, that's why. Uh, in general, our philosophy is try to don't use very uh, exotic process. Use what already uh, one battery manufacturer or gigafactory already have on board that they don't need additional capex or additional investment. Yeah. Second is uh, regarding the project. So we consider that for uh, one ampere hour class solid state pouch cells have been successfully developed by whole consortium, manufactured. And uh, I think it's one great achievement of safely move projects. And uh, during uh, this project, we learned uh, in, in, let's say, in the, if we are talking about manufacturing cells, uh, we, we learned following. For uh, lithium metal anode, less manipulations you do with lithium metal, less time it is in, in, in the work between storage and cell better, otherwise it will, uh, even we, we are working in dry room, it uh, f f can uh, uh, lose properties very fast, especially if you touch it, because there is no, there is no self-healing, unfortunately, in lithium metal, it is not liquid. Yeah. Second is uh, solid state cathode. Uh, uh, if we are talking about slurry processing, uh, we need to avoid uh, volatile components uh, adding. It's difficult because all plasticizers are volatile somehow. Sometimes more than NMP. Then a uh, roll-to-roll process is feasible for, for this and we, we prove this. Uh, let's say slurry coating, slurry preparation, slurry coating and uh, 
calendaring all this roll-to-roll -roll process and we consider that it's absolutely uh, compatible with solid state. Then uh, post-processing is required uh, for these electrodes, otherwise uh, residual porosity will re significantly decrease uh, porosity because we consider that additional process of impregnation of, elect of cell, it, it changed drastically technology because you need to introduce one device and uh, for example in lithium ion I, I can imagine how to do it but in solid state when it's everything compact it's difficult to imagine how, how we can impregnate with something dense stuck. No? That's why we uh, we try to to get electrode as solid as possible, as less porous as possible. Then solid electrolyte. Uh, if we are talking about cross-linking or other type of processes, we recommend to avoid uh, special atmospheres or micro environment, for example argon, because it lim limits a lot. Because finally, you need to have this. Uh, capability and also working with these gases, but it's, I, I admit it's not easy. And uh, mechanical support in form of porous, my, my, microporous <coughs> polyolefin membrane is a feasible solution and uh, will, will work at giga scale. And the assembly, uh, cell assembly and testing, so we need to apply very strict control at every st stage, starting from slurry, slurries or layers, whatever. And then uh, we can use stacking for this technology. See, it's quite easy, scalable. And finally, uh, pressure for testing, maybe not such high like for uh, sulfide-based electrolytes, but some pressure we need because we have lithium metal and it is one uh, electrode that is hostless. So finally, you need to c contain uh, this electrode and make it uh, dense. Yeah, this is uh, briefly conclusions, and uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, European Commission for Funding and Safely Move, all consortium of uh, Safely Move, all partners, even they are not involved in concrete work packages, and uh, some people involved in CDTEC in, 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 in this, because it's really teamwork, uh, pilot plant, uh, solid state battery team, testing team, etc. And uh, yeah, thank you for kind attention. Thank you very much, Andre. Yes, so uh, we will have another question session uh, after myself. So uh, I will be presenting uh, next on behalf of Solidify colleagues. So give me one moment. I didn't see it. Uh, number seven, it was in the SharePoint this morning, but maybe we didn't. Copy it across. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back. No, no, not a problem. Might have been my fault. I was too late. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we do have some time for uh, for a question for Andre. If there's are any. There is actually one question online. Ah, great. Yes, please. Uh, sometimes it takes a bit of time. Okay. It should work now. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, what is the uh, AIC foil? Uh, sorry, AIC. Ah, it is a uh, aluminium carbon coated current collector. Excellent. Are you okay. Uh, and are there any other questions yet, Coulson? Oh, there's one over here. Next Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's me, but that presentation uh, isn't on our system. Uh, <laughs> so we have time for questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andre. N nice presentation. Um, I was wondering the 40 microns of lithium that you have uh, is this serving basically both cathodes? So basically, effectively, you have 20 microns reserved for one side and the other side. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. So okay. we use. Uh, we place in between electrodes just one one foil of 40 micron, yeah. and I mean it uh, me mechanically. So we do it manually, but it it can, it absolutely feasible for for machine I mean, stacking machine also. Yeah, and then the other question was so uh, I mean I mentioned you have you mentioned you have four, five point six f five centimeters by six centimeter electrodes, right? 
five by six stuck stuck. Yeah. Uh, oui. uh, oh, so that, that's not the electrode area. It's electrode area. Fi uh, so five, five by, by six. six yeah, okay. I, 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 let's and say then active. you have seven castles and six anodes. So yes. And then basically you need two point something uh, milliamp hours per centimeter square to get there. So. so this was the aerial capacity. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, as Ma Maria mentioned, we targeted, from in, uh, so there was first uh, generation of the cell, and in one moment we decided, uh, oh, sorry, That's see right, you. I can leave yeah. you also if you like. Uh, so uh, we decided that in order to achieve goals, we need to, uh, uh, actually it was a very stressful decision for, for many, but we say that let's go to three ampere, milliampere hour, otherwise we will not get anything I mean, in sense of uh, yeah, energy yeah. density. So we, we went to this, it was challenging, and this electrode has, uh, let's say, loading uh, three, around three milliampere hour per square centimeter, mm -hmm. uh, works from both sides, so finally we have lithium, cathode, yeah. and end up with lithium. Okay. Uh, and oh, lithium so you have actually some more capacity inside, you have actually more than one ampere hour. Uh, I mean, he, he, uh, of, uh, theoretically, we have like around one ampere hour, yeah. Yeah? but, but the problem is that uh, how you cycle it. So what you see here in, in my presentation, it was uh, range 3, 4.2. Mm -hmm. So we didn't, so it, for, for, because it, for us it was like witness cell, we, we call this. Uh, okay. We assemble, but then there are other partners that in charge of t testing, and today Maria showed some results on this, and later will be more. And I think they, they will maximize this. So they will characterize, uh, and finally we will have perhaps real loading even higher. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's because it's a kind of question of, um, well, let's say, depend how you calculate. But I meant 0.1c, like your charge and discharge rate, that cor that corresponds to 0 0.3 milliamps per centimeter square. Yes, that, yes, in, in this okay. case. Yeah. Okay. In this case. Sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's possible, do you think if it's possible to decrease the, the lithium uh, metal thickness less than uh, 40 micron, micron? Yes, uh, I think it's possible, but then it's a question of uh, cost. I, I, I remember I, uh, uh, we tested one foils, foil 20 micron, but if you use, uh, I mean, maybe Abdel can comment on this better, but as far as I know, cost increases uh, exponentially when you try to decrease thickness of lithium, uh, but uh, uh, manufactured by rolling, cold rolling uh, method, let's say. That's why if you want lower thickness, I think uh, uh, one micron, something like this, we need kind of sputtering techniques or to use something that is not rolling because it will be uh, very, very expensive. And here I think w there was balance between, uh, let's say, uh, what we can do and also uh, handling. Yeah. So because uh, 40 micron is okay. With this we, we can work. So then if there are any further questions, there will be an opportunity uh, after the last talk as well. But thank you very much. Okay, so to introduce myself, I'll be speaking on behalf of the Solidify project, of course, and uh, particularly on behalf of uh, Solith, or which are part of the Surveyma group, who actually provide the tools that we're using in our dry lab at IMEC. And so I'll be giving a presentation on the, the challenges that they see, the tool ad adaptations that they have had to make as well because of the uh, different materials and what's possible, what's not possible, et cetera. So I'd like to just acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Susanna and Marco. Um, so if you have questions, I can also provide their contact details. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to hear from you. Uh, so then hopefully I do it all justice for them. Uh, so just to recap the cell concept of Solidify, um, we want to use this so-called liquid to solid approach, uh, very similar to other approaches that are being used, of course, uh, in the cluster. And we really would like to aim for a two-component assembly, so to not have to include, let's say, the separator as a third component in the assembly itself, but rather that forms part of the composite cathode, and or the composite anode, almost like the excess uh, of the composite cathode that's been infiltrated, for example, or perhaps we coat on the anode directly as well. Uh, both are feasible and what we're exploring within the project at the moment. 
Um, so you've seen this uh, before in our earlier presentation. Um, but then the process flow itself, uh, something that I believe is quite familiar for everyone here. Um, we have the processing of these cell components, of course. We have the preparation. So we have, yes, okay, we have our electrolyte. We have our cathode particles. We then actually need to make the electrodes themselves. Um, and then, of course, infiltrate and create the composite electrodes that we intend to use. And then you go through, let's say, uh, not simple, but uh, the, the typical processing of sizing, stacking, welding might come in different orders depending on the, uh, the process that's used and the sealing. And then, of course, later will be the testing. Uh, so then uh, I have a small picture here. I don't know why that, yeah, the cathode is there as well. So we have our treated anode and our composite cathode. There's just some pictures of what they look like at the moment, um, but these are still, of course, in development. Uh, but today I'll focus on the aspects of the, the tools that are needed for these components and their handling. Um, and this, of course, is very much led by Solith. Um, and of course, Le Clanchet is very much a part of this uh, manufacturability assessment of the solidify cell as well. Um, okay. And really the idea is to take these materials from handling in the lab to uh, an industrial scale. That's the, the goal, of course. Um, not to say that we're going to produce industrial scale components right at the end of Solidify. That is, of course, a goal, but maybe not 2024 later on, I'm sure. So the uh, so Savema Group, so they are um, more or less an umbrella of the... Uh, an umbrella company which has then Solith, which is the particular equipment that we use at IMEC. And uh, mostly they're focusing on the handling of lithium metal, as we all know, can be quite difficult, especially when you're using very thin components. So we're looking at um, lithium metal uh, below 30 micrometers. It's quite fragile, let's say, sticky. I think we're all quite familiar. And then there's aspects of cutting and stacking uh, that need to be taken into account in this equipment. The challenges, of course, as we're all quite familiar with, uh, the sensitivity to humidity, um, but there's also low resistance to attraction that we have to account for, and uh, the soft material. So that really refers to, well, I suppose both the, the anode, but the composite cathode, the overfill, the pill-based electrolyte that's on the surface. It's somewhat um, soft, sticky, it's flexible, it's pliable, um, but then, of course, you, you um, have to adapt tools to ensure that you don't break the surface, etc. And then uh, that's really all already reflected in the last point there on the cathode and the pill. So these are ongoing tests, so it's not uh, completely available technology yet. It's very much um, geared to the solidify challenges. Uh, but this equipment we already have in the lab. So there are some really lovely pictures uh, of the equipment uh, that Solith have provided that we've been using even before uh, the Solidify project. And one would be the rule die, which is used to effectively size your sheet. So you have your sheet, you can slide it into this tool. And uh, almost like cookie cutters, maybe that I shouldn't say that, but yeah, that's how I think about it. They really are, um, at least the ones we have in our lab, um, to size these with the right uh, amount of tab so that later we can do the tab welding as well. And uh, this is all, all these tools are tested on the Solidify materials as well. So this is commercially available equipment and then also it's possible to adjust these steel rule dies to the, to the sizes that you want, of course, uh, and also later I'll show with the materials themselves. And one point I should really point out is the excessive um, pressure on the electrode surface. So it's something that we have to be careful of with the cutting. Um, and that's something that's already taken into account with, the, with, these, with this equipment um, so that we don't deform or cause any damage to the surface. And then we have the, the stacking. So we've gone from our sizing of our electrodes to the stacking of the, these pieces, uh, these electrodes themselves. So typically the Z-fold stacking uh, equipment that you can see uh, pictured here is using uh, the stacking of electrodes and the standard separator. In the Solidify project, we actually want to move to this uh, single stacking. It doesn't mean we're just using one material, but we're effectively not including the stacking of a separator. That's already incorporated into the composite electrodes themselves. So this is something uh, that Solith can, of course, do. 
And, um, and they have created specific trays for each of the components, the anode and the cathode, and they actually have um, a vacuum pad to pick up these pieces, uh, so it's somewhat gentle, <laughs> let's say. Um, and then we also have, we were able to really specifically stack them. I haven't been able to, unfortunately, use the equipment yet. It's something that's in development um, for this, but we already have the main frame, and this can then be adapted to the single stacking system. And so we've gone from our electrode cutting to uh, the stacking, of course, that um, we've also seen uh, already. And then the tab welding and trimming. Uh, there's another machine that we have, let's say, in our pilot line, a Timec as well. And this is then just adapted quite simply to the size of the cell that we intend to use. Uh, we have two sizes in the Solidify project. There's the smaller size, five, roughly five by four centimeters squared. Um, and then, of course, you can change the capacity with the number of stacks you have, of course. And then we have our much larger um, size, getting more towards A4, not quite, um, 10 by 15. Uh, so then we can have these adaptations to these tools so that we can actually have the sizes that we intend, of course. And this has all been decided, of course, like other projects with end users um, within the consortium as well. And then the sealing machine. These are quite hefty pieces of equipment, I have to say. Um, we need quite a, a lot of space, and they really are quite um, reproducible as well. And, uh, and then finally, for the pouch cell sealing, again, it's mostly down to the size of the cell, so it's quite, um, well, I don't make them myself, but a somewhat simple consideration, mostly for the size of the cell itself as well. And then mostly, in summary, because I know we are a little bit short on time, um, the tool adaptations, in summary, really are possible uh, by Solith. This is all in our dry room um, lab as well. And uh, it's really been able to adapt um, the tools relatively simply. Of course, I can't speak for the engineers that actually do this. It might, uh, um, I might be completely skewing uh, that perspective. Um, but with simple th changes like the sizing that you're using um, and also the pressure that you can apply when handling different materials uh, can be adapted, uh, which is, of course, great for the Solidify project. And, uh, of course, it was already highlighted uh, with Andre, really quality control is very important. And with the use of these tools, we hope that we can then have much more reproducible cell production within the project. It's very much a manual process at the moment, um, so it's something that we then really anticipate really boosting the project. And, uh, and then, of course, incoming, I guess, watch this space, um, by May 2024, uh, we then, of course, plan, or we plan already to build these cells, but then we'll have our final results by May, June 2024, where we anticipate one amp hour uh, solidify pouch cells. So I hope I've done them justice. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and this is the last talk. Uh, so Andre, again, maybe you might have to come up to the front. We do still have time for questions. Very sorry. I'll get the other one. And then... My notes on your talk. I'll let you use this one and I can use this. So, yeah. For, for Solidify... Uh, you use lithium metal as anode. How is the yes. equipment modified to handle lithium metal? Uh, so the equipment is already made to mod to, um, at least in our um, facilities, to handle the lithium metal. Um, specifics, I'm afraid I haven't been privy to exactly what they've done, but things like pressure um, and the way they're actually lifting and moving the, the materials have been modified. But I'm, I'm very sorry, I don't have the technical specifics. Yeah, it's just that, that because lithium yeah. sticks to the... Yes, exactly, exactly. So, okay. Yeah, so they've had to then change. Um, the, they can't use the conventional material that they've used in the steel rule die, for example, for, for cutting the, the anode. But um, I haven't been shared uh, specifics. It might be that they can't <laughs> share it. And, and the lithium yeah. is uh, lithium and copper. It's not pure yes. lithium. Yeah, yeah. And also, um, the lithium is also treated with a protective film as well, which does help with handling and with the use of also laminating with the electrolyte as well, which is another option for solidify. Um, handling is actually much easier when we, when we have and, it laminated And the lithium already. is uh, continuously coated. It's yes. not, it's not yeah. intermittent coating. No, it's continuous. Yeah, okay. exactly.
sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. I just have a general question regarding the lithium anode from both of uh, the both of you. So it's uh, oh, sorry the microphone. Yeah. So I have again? a general question for regarding the lithium anode because yeah. for us uh, it was really challenging to find mm -hmm. the lithium metal that is a stable versus our electrolyte. So we had to try different uh, types of. Uh, lithium anodes uh, from different producers uh, and to do a lot of uh, treatment on having a uh, clean surface. Uh, I just wanted to ask in your project, so how do you treat the, the surface? Is it just you buy, uh, you have selected a very pure uh, pr uh, lithium anode from a special producer or you do the treatment yourself? So we actually work with a company based in Latvia, an SME called Sidrabe. And they uh, specialize in the physical vapor deposition of lithium on the copper foils. Um, so then they can also incorporate um, sometimes a protective film, so like lithium nitride, for example, is possible. So we get that directly from them. And then at wherever the anode is being used, we can then laminate with the chosen electrolyte <coughs> as well. Uh, but actually, we only use uh, this supplier. Of lithium. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Parsi. It's very nice talk. I have a question for the project uh, Safely Move. Uh, maybe it's a bit specific, but for the manufacturing of cathodes, you show that you need two steps for to densify the cathode, calendaring and just after pressing. Why is there? Any reasons to to do two steps like that? No, because uh, it, uh, because uh, <coughs> uh, uh, we don't have uh, equipment that can hot press at very high pressure and very high temperature. So then we cannot achieve uh, like in, in during calendaring process the density we, we want or porosity we want. That's why w w uh, in this concrete project we use. Uh, let's say two step, but of course I think um, it's question of um, let's say adapt our equipment and get in, in, maybe in, in, in one shoot uh, this. But uh, we had so many let's say challenges uh, with uh, cathod manufacture, and, and we decided to don't put in risk all these electrodes and just because if you don't apply very high temperature. But very high pressure, you can just break current collector, and it will not be compacting. So it's quite difficult, yeah. And is it possible to do just the uh, pressing and not the calendaring and after the pressing? I mean, uh, I think with yeah. pressing, you don't achieve uh, density. Cal calendaring is much more efficient that, than, than uh, hot pressing on Excel. But uh, sometimes you need this additional step in order to, let's say, increase, maybe reduce 2-3% of porosity in order to get better contact. Okay. So this is more or less story. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I also have a question for Safely Move. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> do you anticipate any issues with anode integrity over in cycling since you don't have a current collector and you're basically using lithium from both sides? Uh, we are inspired in this by uh, Blue Solutions. So they don't use as far as I know. And uh, that's why I think, uh, I mean, we have experience on this. Uh, maybe if we are talking about 20 years and, I don't know, 50,000 cycles, maybe yes, it could be a problem. But uh, simple calculations show that if you add uh, 8 micron of copper as current collector, um, in my opinion, you cannot win lithium ion. Uh, so you cannot overcome energy density of lithium ion. So then, in this case, why do we need the lithium metal? Because it's a headache, uh, basically, uh, from dendrites and other point of view. So then in this case, solution is try to uh, make, uh, uh, let's say, use uh, lithium as active material and current collector. And uh, <clears throat> continuing you, uh, let's say, question, I think uh, alloys could be one 
interest in, for example, with magnesium because magnesium is intact. And finally, you have certain host, and maybe this will be next solution. But with magnesium, there, there are certain problems. Uh, I do have one question. Oh. I'm just very, oh, yeah. very simple question. Um, I'm curious about the reproducibility of the cells. So how many of the cells that you make, do you experience a lot of failures? What's the yeah um, general uh, question? It might be that they short immediately on assembly. It might not. Or later, may it only last one cycle, for example. Uh, uh, taking into account that, for example, this um, generation two cells we assembled for first time, we assembled, if I'm not wrong, 26, uh, we dispatched 25 cells, uh, one for us, and in total I think we assembled 29, so there was few, like uh, during formation we saw yeah. something strange, we decided, mm -hmm. but uh, later pa partners will say us, uh, will tell us what, what is the situation. Of course, it is uh, manual assembly, and here, yeah. you know, in European project you never have time to really polish uh, oh, yeah. manufacturing technology. So that's why I think if we had chance to assemble second batch of this kind of cells, uh, of course it will be much, much uh, better. But I think, uh, yeah, now, uh, let's say, um, like 5% of cells, maybe seven. Okay. Um, yeah. we, we, uh, we have to discard, but yeah. the rest, more or less. Okay, that so you were able to dispatch to partners effectively. Uh, yeah, dispatch, uh, so we dispatched uh, uh, after forming. Mm -hmm. So at least we have uh, confirmation of capacity. We have, uh, we don't see any strange features on charge discharge curves. Very nice. So, okay. Um, this is the Very good. Okay. Oh, yeah, another question, Coulson? Yeah, m more a comment. I just also took our copper current collector out of the cell, and then actually, <laughs> it, it, it's great because uh, like basically with three milliamp hours per centimeter square, you can get to the four hundred watt hours per kilogram, which is which is actually very cool. Yes, and, yes. That, and that's why I use three milliamp hours. So okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, here um, the, the, for, from very beginning, I think conceptually it was uh, like this: uh, no copper. Yeah, yeah. No copper, otherwise, because if you calculate, make very simple Excel calculation, you see that mm, there is no yeah. way. I yeah, would like to I'm try sorry to say this, but because it's mathematics. No. I would like to try to use your lithium because then we are at 450 easy. <laughs> we have yeah, everything else in place. Yeah. 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 Perhaps, yeah, um, kind of lithium magnesium alloy in future, 5-10% can help us to maintain this physical integrity and have kind of host over t uh, during time. Or um, have this uh, famous uh, 3D lithium with some like very light host that can accommodate lithium. But copper, no. <laughs> I don't recommend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, can we please thank all our speakers uh, that comes to the end of our session? So thank you. Okay, so now we do have a break uh, and we'll reconvene at uh, two o'clock. I oh, know, what am I saying? Oh, where am I? <laughs> yeah, at uh, four o'clock, so there's time if you have more questions. Um, relax, tea and coffee should be in the next room. And then we'll start the next session as the topical session number two, which is modeling. Okay, thank you. Thank you.